So uh, a few of you will know that I kind of struggled this week. I'd already prepared a message that I wanted to do earlier on in the week um, because I thought we were going to be back in the book of Acts. And I was kind of excited to be back there after uh, the Advent season. But uh, I really felt that um, there was something just wrong about that. And as I delved into this question on salvation that I was going to touch on, this became more important um, to me. So um, so we're going to have a, a small series on salvation. And what does it actually mean to be saved? What does it mean scripturally to be saved? You know, here in the Deep South, in the South, in the Bible Belt of America, almost everyone is saved, right? And to an evangelist, it feels very much like Catholicism. Like everyone has been has been saved and sprinkled as a Catholic in youth. So the end of the conversation with an evangelist is, yes, I'm saved. And that's the end of the conversation. There's no more thing to be said about it. You know, Chuck Missler said that the only sure barrier to truth is to presume that you already have it. Do we believe that? Think about that. The only sure barrier to truth is to presume that you already have it. So what does it mean to be saved? And how many of us who would call ourselves Christians have stopped to examine this statement properly? So with the world literally coming apart, with things escalating in the Middle East, with things looking so uncertain, I thought, what a... what. What better time would there be than right now to start to look at the concept of being saved scripturally? Not culturally, but scripturally. And to look at it close enough to dispel any confusion that we have about salvation. And to do that, what I wanted to do is go back to Acts. Because in Acts, and our principal um, verse is going to be Acts 2.37. So if you have a, a Bible, a physical Bible, and you'd like to look at that, you can open it there. But the backstory behind that is that it was the Feast of Pentecost. And all the Jews were coming from all over the known world then to Jerusalem. They had to come to Jerusalem for the Feast of Pentecost. And we know that the Disciples were held up in an upper room. They were frightened. They were fearful. They were unempowered. They didn't know what was going to happen. They were scared of the Jews. They were scared of persecution. Jesus had been crucified. He'd been risen again. He told them, go to Jerusalem and wait for the promise of the Father. What's the promise of the Father? Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit. And during that upper room experience, they had tongues of fire coming on top of them. They were empowered with the Spirit. They were overjoyed. And they went out of the upper room into the area outside of this property, wherever that was. And of course, we know through Josephus that there could have been two and a half million Jews in Jerusalem. The place was packed. And all of those people from different places heard the apostles speaking in foreign languages, praising God. And at that point, they had their attention, right? Peter then seizes the opportunity, comes out and starts a sermon, or he starts to explain to them that the very person that the Jews had been waiting for, the Messiah, the Christ, they'd inadvertently shamed, brutalized, crucified, and killed him. And their response to that, is this, they said, now when they heard this, they were cut to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, brothers, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So this is the birth of the church. This is the very beginning. This is the first salvation message after Jesus has been resurrected. So that's why we've come here. That's why we're looking at this specific verse here. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus for the forgiveness of your sins and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. So in the coming messages, what we're going to do then <clears throat> is we're going to look very closely 
at the sequence of events in the process of salvation. But today we're just going to look at repentance. That's the very first thing. It says repent first. Okay, so what does repent mean? Repent, we can think of it. It means to turn away. It means to do a UE, a 180. It means to change one's mind, change one's way. But what are you changing from? You ever thought about that? What exactly are we changing from? Are we changing from unbelief in God? Is that what we're turning around from? Are we turning around from the unbelief of Scripture and the stories within Scripture? So I want us to look at the word. It's important that we understand scripturally what it means. The Greek word is metanoio. I probably pronounced it wrong. It means here, and the way they've expanded this, is to say a change of one's way of life as a result of a complete change of thought and attitude with regard to sin and righteousness. So you're making a U-turn, but you've changed your thinking and attitude towards sin and righteousness. Okay, so the default position of every human being on the planet is this. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way to death. That's how the Bible explains the unregenerate mind of a regular person. Every single person living comes under this blanket description. And it means that what we think is right inevitably is wrong. It is unrighteous. It's not right. But what we do, even as Christians we end up doing this, is we believe ourselves and convince ourselves that what we're doing is right and we end up justifying it. Can we, can we say that that's true? Even as Christians, we do it all the time. We, that's why we constantly need to repent. Sin itself means just to miss the mark. That's what the Hebrew term sin means. It means when you're going to throw a dart at a dartboard and you want to hit the bullseye, you get it wrong. God wants us to get it right. He's not a cosmic killjoy, as the devil would say. He wants us to get it right. So everything that we miss is unrighteousness. So repentance is our thinking and our attitude towards that which is right. Right? Okay. Look at this. For the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages. We get paid when we do something wrong. When we are unrighteous, God pays us something for that. It's wages. We're going to collect the wages at the end of our life. And the wages are death. That's not good. So, but if you think then, okay, so if, if we think we're right, but actually what you're doing is wrong, how do we know that? Can we be blamed for that? And that's where God's law comes in, right? We've all been given the Ten Commandments. We understand what God's law is. It's only the institution of the law that we even know that we've done something wrong. So the ultimate end for all people is a judgment day where the righteous and unrighteous will be separated, right? That is just simply the fact of our position on earth. Jesus says he will place the sheep on his right, the goats on his left. Then the king would say to those on his right, come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you and from the foundation of the world. Good for the sheep. Those on his left, the goats, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. The unrighteous will go into punishment. And that punishment is described as eternal fire. We call it hell. We call it hell. 
Some say a separation from God, and we'll look at that in the coming messages. But many people today, even Christians, do not believe that hell even exists. They don't even. They're being taught that it doesn't exist. They're being taught that it's a metaphysical place. It's a place of symbolism. It represents something, but it's not real. And it made me wonder, when was the last time I heard a message on hell? And to be honest, I couldn't remember a single message. All the different churches I've been to, I couldn't remember one. I've heard it mentioned, but I've never heard it taught on. Why is that? Why is that? In fact, the church now has such an apologetic spirit, it won't even mention hell. But an entire generation has gone past now that simply knows nothing about it. That's, that's bad, right? So this is our common conception now, what a younger generation would think of repentance. That's what we think of. We think of a, a Bible-thumping, angry preacher telling you that you're going to burn. Now look, just this is so amazing. Look, when this picture was taken, the guy on the right there, Look at the two young girls whispering to each other about what's going on. That's amazing that that picture actually caught that. I dare say they're laughing at these two men that are preaching. And of course we do laugh. Look, Bart Simpson. The end is near. The end is near. So it's become a joke. But this is so important if scripture says that we will naturally tend to do that which is wrong and the punishment is hell, should this not be the most important topic we speak of in church? Amen. Like really? It should be the most thoroughly understood concept, should it not? Amen. And yet it's not. By removing judgment, teaching, and downplaying sin, it fosters a mindset that there's no need to repent. Now you've taken away the very first step in being saved. This is why I believe it's so important. Okay, so you've removed judgment, you've downplayed sin, there's no need to repent which is metanoia, which is this idea of changing one's life with a complete change of thought and attitude around sin and what is right. Do we see the enemy's fingerprints all over this? Yes. Look at this. Oh my goodness, look at this. Just look at this. Where do you even start with that? Jesus is going to a gay pride march and he's telling the preacher who's warning them to repent that he'll forgive them. Oh man, like, how blasphemous is that? And yet that is what's being taught, right? Don't judge anyone. Don't judge anyone. Oh my goodness. So in a nutshell, repentance then, repentance is turning from a road that will lead you inevitably to hell. Hell. What is it? And is it real? Hell in scripture, the Hebrew word is sheol. It means pit or grave. It's a place in the earth. The Greek word is Gehenna. And I'm going to use a testimony this morning of a person that was taken to hell. Now you can argue if you want about, is it an out-of-body experience? Is it a vision? Should we listen to someone with that kind of teaching? And more importantly, what we would do as good Baptists is we're going to measure everything against the Word of God, right? Amen. That's what we do. That's why we're Baptists. And we're not Pentecostals. That's why we don't roll around in the aisles and scream and, and say we have a word for someone without anyone ever checking whether it's actually scriptural. 
That's why we are what we are. We're Baptists because we believe that this is the foundation. This is the chain that locks us down so we will not be in error, right? So we can listen to a testimony if it's scripturally correct. And I'm going to show you something. that The word of God is so... I mean, I was just astounded this week, astounded. And I love the word of God. I really do. The more I'm able to study it, the more I see how amazingly honest and brutal and as it cuts to the absolute reality of things on earth. But I've been utterly amazed this week. Look at this. So this is this. And and just so we're clear, the Bible is not just a book. It's a library, right? And this is why we refer to it as a library referred to as the Bible. It's a library of books spanning over 1,500 years, 66 different authors in different times, some of them not even knowing each other. And yet, the truth woven through it is seamless with each other. Isn't that amazing? Praise God. It is living and real. It is God's word. We believe that as Baptists. As Baptists, we believe that. Okay, so here's the testimony. Bill Wise, I'd encourage everyone to go away if you have the stomach for it. I would just encourage you to do that. It's called 23 Minutes in Hell. You will see him to be a very sober, a very straight, and a very, I would argue, reputable person. And he didn't even, wasn't seeking anything like that. The the Lord visited him uh, with this vision. Now, I'm just going to encapsulate it. I'm not going to show any videos. It's too long. I'm just going to encapsulate a few things that he says, and we're going to check them against Scripture to see whether it is actually correct or not. So the story is that he goes to bed. They'd, they'd had a Bible study. He was, him and his wife were just faithful, normal Christians. He was a realtor. He goes to bed. He wakes up at 3 a.m., and he sees himself being lifted away from his body, hence the possibly being called an out-of-body experience. But he sees himself, and the Lord takes him into hell and the first place that he arrives in is a cell he's in a what he describes as a rough hewn stone cell he says that he was lying on the cell floor and it had bars around it it was like a prison cell he said it smelt foul and it was unbearably hot so let's have a look Job 17, 6, will it go down to the bars of Sheol? Remember we said Sheol was a Hebrew word for hell. The pit, shall we descend together into the dust? Bars of Sheol. Have you ever noticed that when you read the Bible? I didn't. Wow. At the roots of the mountains, this is Jonah's testimony, roots of the mountains, right down there. I went down to the land whose bars closed upon me forever. Yet you brought me, you brought up my life from the pit. Oh, Lord, my God. Wow. Isn't that amazing? Bars. Bars. He said that it stank. He will also drink the wine of God's wrath, poured out full strength into the cup of his anger. And he will be tormented with fire and sulfur. Fire and sulfur. You know, it's amazing that the human, the human being can, can get used to almost any bad smell. And you see that with people working in places that stink. You go there and you're like, oh my goodness, I can never work in a place like that, right? Fish or, or being, working at the dump or somewhere where it's really bad, foul-smelling smells. But there's one smell that the body cannot get used to, and that's sulfur. And it's because sulfur is actually toxic. You cannot get used to that smell. That's pretty bad. Who would want to be in a place like that, right? Just the smell alone. Bad. His winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear the threshing floor. This is Jesus. He gathered the wheat into the barn. That's, that's believers, righteous, into the barn. But the chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. That's the heat he's talking about. He says it's unbearably hot. He also said he tried to get up, but he realized... He had no strength at all. The word strength there is, in the Bible when it's used, is it's like being sick with the flu. You're just exhausted. You have no strength. Listen to this. I am counted among those who go down to the pit. I am a man who has no strength. Psalm 88.4. Wow. 
I looked up and saw two giant reptilian monsters 13 feet tall in the cell with me. What in the world? Do you think that's in the Bible? Isaiah 14.9 says, Sheol, hell, beneath is stirred up to meet you when you come. It rouses, that means it, it conjures up the shades to greet you. Shades, the word there, means Rephaim. We've, we've covered this. We've covered it in our giant series. It is a, a race of giants found in Canaan. They were giants. So shades. He said they were filled with rage. He was terrified when he saw them. And they were cursing and blaspheming. This is speaking of the beast in Revelation 13. It opened its mouth to utter blasphemies against God. Blaspheming his name and his dwelling. That is those who dwell in heaven. He said it became then so dark that the darkness was palpable. He could actually feel darkness. Look at this. He has made me to dwell in darkness like the dead of long ago. Lamentations. And look at this. Then the Lord said to Moses, stretch out your hand toward heaven that they may be darkness over the land of Egypt, a darkness to be felt. This was just before the final judgment in Egypt, right? A darkness that's so dark, it's almost palpable. It almost is like an entity living. How terrifying is that? Then he was taken out of the cell. And he was taken to a large pit. In fact, he said that there were smaller pits within this large pit. And he said it was full of fire. The fire was just huge flames were being shooting up from this pit. And he began to see the outline of people and they were screaming. He said the noise was deafening. People screaming on fire. What a horror show. Anyone does not abide in me, he is thrown away like a branch and withers. And the branches are gathered, thrown into the fire. It's a place of fire. It's a place of fire. I could make out bodies writhing in agony. This is horrid. Their flesh burning and falling off. What a place. And in Jude it says, just as Sodom and Gomorrah and the other surrounding cities, which likewise indulged in sexual immorality and pursued unnatural desire, serve as an example by undergoing a punishment of eternal fire. Wow, an eternal fire. And there's no peace. Torment. That's what it means. There's no peace in this place. I said, as he looked up, he saw literally things like burning rocks. Brimstone, the King James would have called it. Burning rocks falling out from the flames that were shooting above. Landing on the people beneath them. Look at this. Psalm 11, 6. Let him rain coals on the wicked. Fire and sulfur and a scorching wind shall be the portion of their cup. Oh my. Let burning coals fall upon them. Psalm 140. Let them be cast into fire, into miry pits. No more to rise. And then this, unbelievable. I could see millions of maggots underneath the people, but also on top of them. He said it was thick. The whole ground was thick with maggots, millions of them. Do you think that's in the Bible? Isaiah 14, 11. Your pomp is brought down to Sheol. The sound of your harps, maggots, are laid as a bed beneath you. And worms are your covers. Worms, they're the same word for maggots. That's horrid. Horrid. The womb shall forget him, Job 24. The worm, the maggot, shall feed sweetly on him. You know, maggots will eat until the flesh is gone. And then they die. But look what Jesus said. 
In Mark 9, 48, where their worm, the maggot, does not die, and the fire is not quenched. This is the worst horror story that anyone could ever dream up. And it's not a metaphorical place. This is real. This is a terrible, terrible place. Jesus spoke of hell in 49 verses, 18 of them about fire of hell. Hell is not, listen, a cartoonish place where the devil is somehow on some big throne in charge of his minions. He's not even in hell, but he is going there and he will be tormented forever and ever in that place. You know, we hear this ridiculous idea that somehow unbelievers are going to get to have some kind of gambling party where they're going to be drinking all together in this place and, you know, they'll be able to do whatever they want. No, the Bible does not say that. The enemy says that. The enemy teaches that, but not the word of God. He will render to each one according to his works. To those who by patience in well-doing seek for glory and honor and immortality, he will give eternal life. Praise God. But for those who are self-seeking and do not obey the truth, but obey unrighteousness, there will be wrath and fury. So who's going to go there? Right. All who do wrong? You might say, hey, but I'm a good person. Good people go to heaven, right? I'm not as bad as Hitler or Stalin or Pol Pot or any number of people that you could mention. Maybe you would mention Hillary Clinton. I'm not as bad as Hillary Clinton. I'm not as bad as Donald Trump. Why would I go there? But see, God doesn't compare you to other people. That's what we do. We constantly, we even compare ourselves to other Christians to make us feel better. God compares us to his law. So listen, I want to I wanna do something. Please, let's just be honest this morning. And I'm going to be the first one to be honest. But I'm, we're going to do a quiz, okay? We're going to find out how good we actually are. And please just raise your hand. Don't worry about anyone else. Just be honest now while we're here. We're just going to pl play a quick quiz. So here's the first law. You should not bear fullness, false witness against your neighbor. You should not lie, right? If we ever lied, come on. Let's be honest this morning. Let's just... Let's, we're all liars. I'm a liar. We've all lied. What does the Bible call someone who lies? Liar. A liar. Okay. You shall not steal. Who's stolen something? Come on. Come on. We've all stolen something, right? Even if it's small, paper clip, a pen, you know. We've, you know, we, you hear that, right? A pen from work, whatever. What do you call someone that steals? A thief. A thief. You should not commit adultery. Now, many of us could say, oh, not done that. Not done that. But how did Jesus pan out? How did Jesus flesh out that commandment? He has said, you've heard, you should not commit adultery. But I say to you that everyone who looks at a woman with lustful intent or a man has already committed adultery with her in his heart. Who has? I have. Not proud of it. I have. Yeah. What does the Bible call that person? An adulterer. An adulterer. Last one. Almost done. You should not take, take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Who, who's done it? Might have slipped out, right? Maybe before we were Christians, we've done it. What do they call that? What do we call that? What's the Bible call that? Even out the name of 
Yeah, that's what it's called. What do they call that? Uh, what do they, what will you call someone who takes the Lord's name in vain? It's a, a, a blasphemer, right? A blasphemer. So by our own mouth, listen, this is important. By our own mouth, we are, myself included, a bunch of lying, blaspheming thieves who are adulterers at heart. That's our position. That's our position. Christian or not, we've already done it, right? We've already done it. Listen, even if you sin just five times a day, it sounds a lot, but it's not, right? Even five times a day, just five times a day, in a year, that would be 1,825 times you've sinned. If you live to be 70, it would be 127,000 times. Every one of them has been written. Every one of them, God says when he faces you, you will have to make an account for that. You're going to have to explain why you did what you did. 127,000 times. Let me tell you, some days in my life, I've sinned way more than five times. And I think we can all be honest and say, probably, yeah. In fact, there's such thing as called presumptuous sin, but we don't even know we're sinning when we're, sin when we're sinning. And he will bring those up too. So on judgment day, with that prognosis, what are we, guilty or innocent? Come on, say it. What are we? We're guilty, right? Oh my goodness. Heaven or hell? Hell. Hell. Look at this. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law. Are we under the law? Yes, we're under the law. Wait, okay, I know what you're going to say. We're under the law because the law was given to us, right? The first Pentecost given to, to Moses on Mount Sinai. Why? So that every mouth may be stopped. On judgment day, you will not be able to say anything. We cannot say anything. 127,000 times. <laughs> even we will say, okay, I'll just take myself there already, okay? You need to give me the determination. I'm just going to go now. Because it's just going to be a horror show of shame about what we've done. And the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight. Since through the law comes the knowledge of sin. Amen. And when we face him, his holiness will be such that our wretchedness will be so obvious. That there's nothing that we're going to be able to say. Right? That is, our, that is our default position. We will have to go to an unbearably hot place filled with notch, noxious smoke. There's no water. You feel weak. You feel sick. There's no strength. You'll be subjected to the most excruciating pain. Your flesh will be on fire. You will lie amongst maggots. They'll be feeding on you. You will never be able to sleep. You'll never be able to even die to have any reprieve from that position. There's no fellowship. There's no communion with anyone. The only communication you will have is hearing the screams of those around you in the same helpless position. And the worst bit, it will go on and on and on and on and on with no end in sight. And according to God's law, we deserve hell. But the last thing, if you die tonight and you do not know the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you will be going and you will hear this, depart from me, you cursed into the eternal fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Now that, my friends, is bad news. That is bad news. That is the lot of every single person on this planet that does not know the Lord Jesus Christ. That is what that is what we will be. That picture there. Horror of horror of horror. Now the most amazing thing that God's scripture only states the facts. If you're alive today on earth, you are metaphorically on a plane that is traveling and nose diving and is about to crash from 35,000 feet. Nothing you can do. There's nothing you can do. However, however, the good news, 
the good news, the gospel, good news, the parachute, is that if you see your path is unrighteous, if you see that what you've done deserves hell and death, your attitude towards sin has changed, then you're ready to repent, right? Praise God. God. You see, there is no good news without bad news. There just isn't. People hear the gospel today in a modern church and they just think, you know what, I don't actually need Jesus. It sounds pretty good, like my life might be somewhat better to tack him on on a Sunday onto my already pretty good life. But I don't need him. And that's the kind of gospel that is being preached. But that's not a gospel at all. Because you've removed the very thing that screams at them that their position is absolutely dire. And that's what we've gotten scared of. And that's taken all the power away from our preaching. What a tragedy. And there it is. Right in Acts 2. Repent. You have to repent. But what if you don't understand what you're repenting from? But now we do. Who in their right mind would even think about going to that place? For anything on earth. If you were offered anything. If you had a taste of hell. A taste of it. And let me tell you something. When Bill Wise woke up, his wife woke from her bed, hearing him scream. He said that he had some kind of amnesia. He woke up, he realized he'd been to hell, and then suddenly the Lord brought those memories flooding back, and he was screaming, screaming. And she said he'd, she thought he was, he was dying. She, he was, she was so shocked by his reaction. And all he was, he was just screaming about what he just witnessed. If you could show every single person that for eternity, which we can't even grasp. And then you offer them anything in the world. They're never going to take it, right? They're never going to take it. Because they will know that eternity in hell awaits them. So the enemy, what he's done is just to masquerade hell. That's why we've moved away from the Old Testament. Look at all those scriptures we looked at just then. All Old Testament stuff. In the Psalms, Isaiah, Job, Lamentation. Wow. And yet we've been moving away from the Old Testament. Oh, the Old Testament's old. It doesn't really apply to us. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Is not the word of God absolutely stunning in its brutality and and preciseness? Peter said to them, repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. The forgiveness of your sins. And that's what he says. He says, hey, you're, you're, you're in a dire situation. But guess what? The Lord Jesus took all that on him so that you wouldn't have to. Now that is good news. That is something that we can grasp a hold of And it's not just a mental assent to something. There is something that happens when you truly understand that you're a sinner and that Jesus has taken your position and you believe on him. He gives you something. He gives you joy. Do you remember that when you were first saved? You had that joy. We've lost that. Sometimes the church service seems so melancholy. And really, we should be jumping up and down. God has saved us. God has saved us. We can get a bit back to costal sometimes, right? We can put our arms up and say, praise God, I deserved hell. And yet Jesus gave me heaven. Praise God. God. So listen, I would just say to any one of you, that process is in order for a reason. Now, there are some people who believe that they never really knew when they became a Christian. Maybe never really have dwelt on their own sin. And I would just ask you, please, there's no sinner. Listen, the sinner's prayer is not in the Bible. This very quaint little thing. Sometimes you see people, they're behind their pew and they'll just put their hand up and partake in a prayer that the pastor's doing. That's not repentance. 
Repentance is seeing the horror of your own actions and where those actions will take you. Amen. Until you see that, you cannot change your mind. The good news is not good news because you don't actually think you need it. You don't think you need to repent of anything. And why would you? Because no one's told you what the bad news is. That's the bad news. But the good news is that Jesus took away that punishment, that you can stand shameless before him. Those 127,000 plus sins will be, he will look at you and see the righteousness of Christ. Radiant. You'll be radiant. And he will welcome you into eternal life. Welcome you, good and faithful servant. My goodness. My goodness. So please, if any of you do not know, like really know that you're saved, there is no better time than this morning. We're at the end of the year. <laughs> Why not step into the new year knowing that your salvation is secure? And over the next couple of weeks, we're going to look at that. And it can be secure and it can be straight in your head and you can have joy. And we can revisit that joy too, right? Praise God. Amen. That's what we'd be looking at. Look at this. Because if you confess with your mouth, that's your sin, and that Jesus Christ is Lord and believe in your heart, None of us were witnesses. We'll never know someone that witnessed him, but we can read about it. And it's a purpose of our mind to accept that he did do that. He, he was crucified. He did die. He was raised again. But there is something spectacular that happens within us when we do that. We are born again. Praise God. You will be saved. Look, you will be saved. Praise God. And then we can be joyful. We can be joyful, praise God. And in this time on earth at the moment, we need that. We need to revisit that. We need to revisit, are we really saved? And, and straighten that out. There is no confusion, but repentance must come first. And repentance can only come when we realize the dire situation that we're in without the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Let's pray.